virtually everyone. When these brain waves are compared with the sleeper's rapid eye movements, known as REM, a clear relationship emerges. Recurrent episodes of REM sleep are accompanied by very rapid, irregular changes of low electrical voltage in the brain. When subjects are awakened during periods of REM, which come about every 90 minutes throughout the night, most of them report that they are dreaming. This is a diagram of a typical night of sleep in a human, a young adult who's sleeping quite well. If you follow this line here, it shows that beginning from waking, a person goes into deeper and deeper non-REM sleep. So this means slow waves in the EEG, brain waves. Then after 90 minutes, there's a dream period, a REM period, with a lot of activation. The same thing happens four or five times during the night. Usually there are one or two awakenings during the night too. But this is the typical pattern that we all go through, quite surprisingly, whether or not, whether we remember 200 dreams a year, as some people do, or never remember a dream, we still go through this pattern. So it's possible to have a scientifically precise index of a dream, an experience we usually have for a total of about two and a half hours each night. But what do dreams mean? Since the dawn of history, people have been analyzing them as forecasts of the future, or as the intervention of spirits of the dead. But it was Sigmund Freud who put dreams on a unique psychological pedestal. Dreams were significant, said Freud, because they revealed the presence of deep secrets that the unconscious part of the mind was trying to hide from its conscious awareness. This is Freud's office in Vienna, where he analyzed his patients' dreams as they lay on his couch. Acting as a sort of psychological archaeologist, Freud tried to unearth the hidden associations and symbolic meanings of these dreams, which he believed concealed unconscious desires and fears, many of them sexual. But there's another current theory that proposes that dreams begin not with unconscious wishes, but with a spontaneous discharge of random bursts of electrical impulses deep within the brain stem. The proponents of this controversial new theory are Robert McCarley of the Harvard Medical School and his colleague, J. Allen Hobson. It's as if in this primitive part of your brain called the brain stem, there's an automatic activation system that turns on every 90 minutes for 30 minutes or so. And it produces this structured series of activations. And the dreamer knits them together. But meaning is built into the dream, we think, and it's not intrinsically a part of the dream itself. McCarley and Hobson call these ideas the activation synthesis theory. During a dream, the part of the brain called the pons sends electrical charges to the forebrain. That's what they mean by activation. The dreamer then tries to make sense of it all by creating a storyline. That's what they mean by synthesis. In other words, the brain creates order out of chaos. The brain is a marvelous organ. And one of its things that it loves to do is to try to organize and to try to make meaning even if no meaning is there. And that is the way that our brain is constructed. We're more or less forced to uh, try to knit together a uh, coherent picture of the world. McCarley has measured the electrical impulses in the brain during dreaming. But these impulses are only turned on for body maintenance and memory storage, McCarley says, and not for the sake of dreaming. Why do we breathe? We, we don't breathe for any particular meaning. We breathe so that we can continue to live. Why does blood go to our brain? It doesn't go there for any particular meaning. It goes there so our brain can continue to survive and function. I think dreaming sleep or REM sleep is like that. Now, REM sleep is not only our special property as humans. REM sleep is seen throughout in the entire mammal kingdom and is present to a small extent in birds. 
So it's something we share as part of a common biological heritage dating back millions of years. Now, it's hard to imagine chipmunks having dreams as a way of generating some kind of internal meaning. They have REM sleep, but it's hard to imagine that this is generated by a psychological process, for example. The other kind of evidence that REM sleep, the basis, the biological state associated with dreaming, is something that's built into the brain, comes from our own personal history. And when we we're first born, we spend over half our time in dreaming sleep. It's something very important to the brain. And we think that what REM sleep likely does to the brain is furnish an internal source of activation that promotes growth and development of the brain. So it's present in infants whose psychological apparatus is very poorly developed and who probably don't have many complex psychological constructs, but they dream a lot. They dream even more before they're born. The Hobson-McCarley theory of dreams is still very controversial. In fact, an article outlining it in the American Journal of Psychiatry provoked more letters to the editor than any other article in the journal's history. But there's also a middle ground between their theory that dreams are all physiological in origin and Freud's theory that they're all psychological. This middle view starts with the brain's ability to form an idea about what the external world is like based on the information available to it. This construction or model of the world, which is formed by the cerebral cortex, both informs our beliefs and directs our actions. But when we sleep, information from the external world is largely cut off. So the only world our constantly active brain can model is the one already inside it. Stored memories, recent concerns, current emotions and expectations, which can be activated by electrical impulses discharged from within the brain. In other words, dreams are the interplay of the physiological triggering of brain waves and the psychological functioning of the imaginative, interpretive parts of the mind. Stephen LeBurge of Stanford University has been studying this interplay between mind and body in a series of provocative experiments on dreaming. Our scientific laboratory studies have indicated that there are striking correspondences between what you do in the dream state and what happens to your physical body and brain. So that if you dream you're doing something, to your brain it's as if you're actually doing this. Fortunately, there are, there are some uh, restraints on physiological responses. For instance, in some of our work with dream sex, we found that in the lucid dream state that people's respiration rate would double, for instance, but uh, their heart rates only went up by 5 or 10 beats per minute instead of doubling. And it seems that the heart rate is held down in the dream state, in REM sleep, uh, by the strong parasympathetic nervous system activation. So that there's some built-in safety factors that prevent uh, you from acting out your dream. Likewise, your muscles are generally paralyzed during REM sleep. So if you dream you're running, you don't actually run. What happens is the brain sends impulses to your muscles, you know, probably the same ones that would if you were actually running, except for thanks to the part of the brain that prevents you from acting out your dreams. You just get twitches in your legs that correspond to it. So it's really the brain is the level on which you find the most striking changes so that if you dream, you sing or count, the same parts of the brain get activated as would if you were actually singing and counting. The work being done in LeBurge's sleep lab also involves the relationship between the mind and the dream itself, especially in a dream state known as lucid dreaming. A lucid dream is a dream in which you know that you're dreaming while it's happening, so that you're in the middle of a dream and suddenly something tells you that you're dreaming, that you're making it all up, it's all in your own mind, and therefore that you could do anything. Are you awake then? Yes. What just happened? I was dreaming, I was sitting in a car, when suddenly the sun was in my eyes. But almost immediately, I knew that it was not the sun, but actually the light. I knew I was dreaming. So I flew out of the window of the car. Well, that sounds good. You... Dreamers were taught to clench their fists and use very specific eye movements to alert LeBurge when they were having a lucid dream. LeBurge then triggered a flashing light which brought the dreamers to conscious awareness of the dream. 
The dreamer could then take conscious control of the dream and even alter its outcome. Let's say you're running away from something. You realize it's just a dream. Then you can get the extra courage necessary to turn around and face it, say, what is this? What do you want? And it, in my experience, when you do this, you... Every time the dream transforms in some positive way so that whatever you're afraid of then becomes friendly in some way. And that from having faced these fears, naturally your waking self-confidence improves. The idea of changing the direction of a dream is highly controversial. Many psychologists feel that a dreamer should allow a dream to follow its own course to fully benefit from the dream symbolism. But Laberge suggests that if something is chasing you, it doesn't necessarily matter what that something symbolizes. Simply facing it in your dream may subconsciously solve the problem. The kind of argument to say that you shouldn't control your dreams, I think is exactly parallel. You shouldn't control your thinking. Your thinking should just be random and however it happens without the conscious mind. Wherever they stand in this controversy, Many psychologists are fascinated by lucid dreaming, mainly because it represents a new way of intentionally altering our consciousness. While daydreaming, fantasizing, sleeping and dreaming are the stuff of ordinary alterations in consciousness, other kinds of alterations may provide new insights into how our mind works. What happens, for instance, when people use psychoactive drugs or hypnosis or when they undergo an operation that separates the cerebral cortex into two parts that can't communicate with each other. Or when they develop multiple personalities to cope with severe mental problems. What transformations in consciousness occur then? Join us next time for some of the most remarkable and unusual aspects of consciousness. The mind hidden and divided. Until then, I'm Philip Zimbardo. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.